All mystical writings, it is not specific to Rumi and he is not the initiator or the inventor or the innovator of the issue. It is everywhere. And to the extent that uh, you would even find it in Ghazali, who was, of course, a man not for uh, love purely, but for reason as well. But uh, as you know, for example, Muhammad Ghazali, who was the great scholar and the great thinker of the fifth century, he had a brother called Ahmad Ghazali, and uh, who did not like a scholarship and uh, the rational sciences like his brother. Rather, he was for love and he wrote a very important and influential book on, the, on love and which no doubt was uh, influential on Rumi himself. And uh, so the idea of the love and uh, taking one in order to, uh, to uh, <coughs> leave the other has been always the story of all mysticism including Islamic Sufism or Islamic mysticism. No wonder that we find it very conspicuous, very significant in Rumi's works as well. Um, looking back at the story of Rumi himself uh, also gives us some indication uh, to this because he was as we uh, saw <coughs> a theologian, a commentator on Quran and uh, a man of uh, a very good orator and he left all that behind uh, uh, because of the Shams's teachings and he opted for mysticism so all this actually <coughs> tells us it was in the mind of Rumi about reason, intellect and about love and the superiority of one over the other and the inferiority of one with regard to the other and uh, I mean by and by in the modern jargon he developed a kind of epistemology, epistemology in which love is on the top and is the main foundation and the main principle and reason actually occupies a very small uh, and base place. Uh, his hostility towards uh, reasoning or reason or intellect must be interpreted correctly, otherwise one would be misled into strong ideas about his epistemology. Uh, though, as I said, Sufis and Rumi for that matter, they, did, they were not there in order to be an epistemological system, a philosophy or something. All mysticism is based on perplexity, as I said before, and perplexity is not suitable for building a system. It is apt and prone to contradictions, and uh, Sufis were not shy. They're not showing away from contradictions, from perplexities, even from some sort of confusion, if you like. It was a madness of love that they preferred over the clarity of conceptualizations of philosophers and so on. So that was their way. And because of that, they did not build and they did not offer any philosophical, epistemological system whatsoever, a consistent system. Nevertheless, we can find and we can elicit a kind of epistemology from their uh, teachings and from their works. And here in Masnavi, of course, not in Divan, <coughs> which is a fully mad love. In Masnavi, in which he was a sober teacher, we can discern a kind of epistemology which I am going to uh, discuss now and here. In all epistemology, you have to have uh, uh, some ideas about uh, some very lofty concepts, certainty, intellect, language, and the like. These are the uh, capitals of the epistemologist. And uh, as a, an epistemologist, you have to have your own ideas about this concept. Where you situate the language in the human understanding of the world where you situate the certainty or supposition and so on, where you situate the science and the intellect, things like that. And in all these fields, you will find Rumi has got something to say, something very deep to say. I think we saw his ideas about language itself. 
Bhumi always complains of, of language, of the shortcomings of language. He thinks that the ordinary conventional language is for the ordinary conventional experiences of man in this material world. And uh, for the forms, as he puts it, but when it comes to the formlessness, to the formless world, there is no language, or at least our conventional, ordinary language is not there in order to describe the experiences of the formlessness. So the shortcomings of the language is so apparent to him, so visible to him, that he misses no opportunity in order to complain, in order to tell us that the language is not only a help, an aid to him, but a hindrance, an obstacle to him, in order to convey his message, in order to put forward his ideas, in order to conceptualize the, uh, the, the experiences that he has. In one place, actually, he says that he, wish, he wishes that the, the being itself has got its own language, uh, in order to spare him from using his own language. And uh, the language of the being, of course, is silence, according to Rumi. And that's why he uses silence as an eponym for himself. Most of his sonnets and odes actually are ended with the word silence, hamush in, in Persian, to the extent that people have thought, some of the people, some of the scholars have thought that this is the second name, on an adopted name for, for Rumi. But that's not the case. He uses the word be silent, silence and then because he thinks that to say is not sufficient and even it is as I said a veil on the idea on the meaning and the intention of the sayer of the orator therefore he thinks some say, somewhere actually in mass maybe he says in silence my sayings even would become clearer so that he, he opts for silence and to stop saying, stop reciting, stop writing poems, and so on and so forth. So the word hamush or silence is very frequently and repeatedly used in is, is very frequently and repeatedly used in his writings, maybe more than any other poet, any other writer in, in Persian. Uh, so anyway, as far as the shortcomings of the language is concerned, as I said, he's very explicit on that, and uh, this is his own, uh, actually, experience. He didn't find the uh, language helpful at all. And here actually comes in the imagery of, of fish in his writings. He says that fish are always silent. And uh, among the, of course, according to the old biology, I'm not sure of the modern biology, maybe they have got some sounds or voices, I'm not sure, but according to the old biology, birds have got sounds, human beings have got sound and everything, but the, uh, the, 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 the fish, they have no voice, no sound, nothing. And uh, among many characteristics that fish have, the silence is so appealing to, to Rumi that he mentions this. Of course, he thinks that, uh, and I, I think I mentioned it last time, that in, in, in the case of fish, um, <coughs> uh, there are many characteristics, especially that they have got no belonging, nothing. Their house is water, their food is water, their drink is water, their clothing is water, everything is water. And on top of all this, they are silent. They do not say anything. And they are the best example of a Sufi, of a mystic, of a contemplative who is immersed in the ocean of the grace of God. Really, that is what he means. And, uh, and in addition to that also, fish is, as, as you know, a symbol of Christ, of course. I mean, in, in, in Christianity and also in, in Islam. Therefore, when he uses the symbol of fish, also he has got... A, a hidden allusion to the idea of the Jesus, the person of Jesus and Christ. And uh, as you know, Rumi personally was in love with Jesus because he thought that he was a